It's Nicola here at the Disasters Emergency Committee on day nine of our East Africa crisis appeal. There's a somber mood here in London today, and I want to take a moment to reflect on what your generous donations to an appeal like ours are really about. Your donations are acts of kindness from one human being to another, reaching out to other people in their time of need, be they close to home or far away. Your donations are about empathy with people who may have very different lives to ours. They're about the kindness of strangers and ultimately about our shared humanity. Joining me today is Shaista Aziz, working with DEC member charity ActionAid, who has recently returned from Somaliland, where she met some of those people who will be helped by your donations to our East Africa crisis appeal. Welcome, Shaista. Hi, Nicola. Um, so you're here to talk about some of the women that you met in Somaliland and how they're affected by the crisis that they're facing. That's right. So I spent a lot of time on the Somaliland-Ethiopia border. I met lots of different people. Most of them were women because their husbands, their brothers, their sons had all migrated uh, trying to keep their livestock alive. So this drought has really taken hold. Yeah, there's been no rainfall for more than two years. And so lots of people are on the move. The men are on the move. <coughs> The livestock's on the move, the wildlife is on the move. And what's, what's left in these communities is predominantly women, uh, women of different ages, and children. And so these women are left now to raise the children, fend for them, try and find food. And in many cases, what these women told me was that they are eating at least one meal a day, if they're lucky, two meals a day. And when I say meals, uh, they're eating mm. handfuls of rice and, and maize. Uh, and that's the best that they can do right now because they've exhausted all their options. Their livestock has died. One woman told me that more than 300 of her uh, sheep and um, camels died just in the last six months because they can't find water and they can't find food to keep them alive. Yeah, and one of the interesting things, some people ask us in our materials, we focus a lot on the effects on children, but we also focus a lot on the effects um, on women and people sometimes comment that we show a lot of women in our pictures and not so much men. So can you tell us how uh, a situation in a crisis like this affects m women differently to men? Yeah, so women are definitely affected in a different way because in many societies uh, women are expected to stay back and to you know provide for their children uh, mm. and to take care of the caregivers basically and so you know they they have an extra burden on them to provide that care and so you know like i said there were lots of women that i met who were really struggling just to find enough food every day to, to keep their families going. And the other thing is, if the men have gone to try and keep mm -hmm. the livestock alive, the women then feel more vulnerable. So they feel vulnerable to potentially uh, abuse, including sexual abuse. Uh, in many cases, women are having to walk further uh, distances. So for example, in Kenya as well, where the drought has also mm -hmm. taken hold, I was speaking to an Action Aid colleague there yesterday, and she was saying that women are having to walk much, much further now, and they're also having to go into the into to the um, forest to find wood, um, firewood, and they feel really vulnerable to being abused. And they are being, in many cases, uh, they have been propositioned and told that by men that if you provide us with sex, for example, then you can go into the forest to get the wood. Um, the other way that uh, women and girls in particular are affected is that I went to a school on the um, Somaliland-Ethiopia border, and the teacher there was saying that a lot of students have are no longer in the school. It's because the families, they're pastoralists, they've migrated to try and keep their livestock alive. But also girls, they're the first to drop out of school because when their family members are moving on to try and keep livestock alive, these girls are then expected to stay at home with the women uh, and to try and, you know, to assist the women in finding water and finding food and uh, keeping everything yeah. going. And that has a long-term effect on a girl because when a girl leaves school, it's going to take a very long time, if ever, for her to return to school. And it has a really long-term impact on her. And I know that ActionAid has been working in Somaliland for many, many years. So can you tell me how ActionAid is involving these women that you're talking about in the response to this crisis? Well, often in emergencies such as this, the women are not seen or heard. And ActionAid believes it's vital for women to be seen and heard. And so we put women at the heart of our emergency response, our humanitarian response. Now, what does that mean? What that means is that women's groups and individual women 
are very much given a seat at the table. Their voices are right at the forefront of when we're planning uh, our aid distributions, for example. It's the women in these communities. They understand what's going on. They know exactly who's in need in their communities. And so they make sure that, you know, that information is given to ActionAid. And beyond that, I think that in, in emergencies, you often see on television, for example, lots of uh, aid queues of men, mostly. Mm. You don't really see that many women. And so uh, by putting women at the heart of the response, it means that women do actually get what they need. They're not just an afterthought. And this is very important, especially given that I've already explained the context that in a lot of these communities, no men are there. So, you know, it's very important then that the people who are there are the ones who get the assistance and they get it directly. Yes. And so, I mean, one of the things we've emphasised with this appeal um, is the not delaying and acting now and talking about that there being 16 million people facing starvation across the East Africa region. But we've very much focused on acting now and not delaying and not waiting until it's too late. So can you elaborate on why it is so important that people continue to donate now so that we can scale up our response now? Yeah, well, first of all, I mean, as always, we're overwhelmed with the generosity of the British public. You know, these are difficult times in our own country and people are struggling in many ways, as we know. And, you know, we're always overwhelmed by how generous the British mm. public is. They've always been generous historically and they've, they've mm. really dug deep in their pockets. So we thank them for doing that. And then I think we have to address the other elephant in the room, which is Africa. So a lot of people mm. say, well, you know, Africa's received X number of pounds and dollars over how many years, and why are things so bad? And the simple answer is that, you know, we can't hold people responsible for lack of rain. Mm. It hasn't rained for more than two mm. years. You know, they've done everything they can to keep them and their, themselves afloat. Uh, the people I met are very proud, very dignified people. Yeah. Now, when your livestock dies, the people in Somaliland told me that actually part of their pride dies, part of their identity mm. dies, because they are pastoralists. So they put all their love and attention in these animals that then give back to them. So, for example, if your child is sick and you own, um, you know, a sheep or camel, you can take your livestock to a market and get money and then provide medicine to your child. But if your livestock is dead, you can't do anything. So. Um, these people, you know, they've exhausted all their options and they're not looking for handouts. <coughs> very dignified, very calm yeah. people. Um, but the fact, fact of the matter is they cannot continue the way that they are. And also, I think the other thing is when you hear these big numbers like 16 million, mm. 18 million, it's very overwhelming. But I think it's very important to remember these are individuals. As you said, mm. you know, we are all connected in a way, right? Mm. So these are individuals. These are people like us. Um, you know, I mentioned, I think, that I met this 90-year-old grandmother. Uh, she was left by herself uh, to take care of her small grandson. And, you know, it was so poignant to see how she was clinging on to him for dear life. Yeah. It was almost like she was hugging a tree and she had such love and affection for that boy. Mm. And, you know, that's like grandmothers everywhere in the world. And uh, when we said, what do you need? And she said, um, I just need my, my grandson to be happy. I need him to be able to eat. And so I think this is really what this is about. This is about people, real people, um, you know, people who have dignity, who have families, who love each other, and they're struggling, and they're trying to keep each other going. And the money that the British public has given so generously, that money will go directly to keeping people alive. And the final thing I want to say, Nicola, is that, you know, we keep hearing that perhaps this famine, this drought will tip into a famine, and it could become mm -hmm. as bad as 2011. We don't need things to be that bad. We have a window of opportunity to save people's lives. We need to take that. Uh, the British public have stepped up, and we know that they will continue to be generous. And what we're saying to the world is that this can't, this can't happen. We cannot have hundreds and thousands of people dying. We can save lives, and we must. Yes, and Shaista has touched on the generosity of the British public and the way that the British, the British um, people and, and the government are, are leading the world in trying to step up to this crisis. Um, so I have one last um, piece of news today. Um, our fundraising total has now reached £32 million, which is fantastic. And again, showing how generous the British public are, how we are setting the tone for the rest of the world to help, alleviate, uh, you know, to help not have a, a, a catastrophe on a massive scale. It is still terrible there, but it could get so much worse if we don't act now. Um, and on some of my updates, um, I've explained what the DEC is all about, but I think it's worth thinking about again today that we are an umbrella organisation of 13 of the UK's leading aid agencies that come together at times of uh, great humanitarian crisis 
um, to raise as much money as possible. And I think that this new fundraising total reinforces one of the core beliefs on which the DEC fa is founded, that together we're stronger and together we can make a real difference to the lives of the people in East Africa.